Hello, welcome back. I'm Masood Raja, and today I am going to embark on a perilous journey, and that is I will be recording a series of lectures on Gayatri Spivax, Can the Subaltern Speak? A lot of people have asked me for it, but I've been reluctant to do that because, to be honest, I think I probably do not have the wherewithal to deal with Spivak's work, but I'll give it a try anyway. This particular lecture is an introductory lecture that sets the stage for other parts of this lecture. And here I would like to point out that this particular essay was an occasional essay, just like an occasional poem. Why was it an occasional essay? Because Spivak was responding to an interview by Deleuze and Foucault. I mean, it's very obvious in the first two or three pages of the essay that she is doing that. Now, I have a copy of that interview on my website and I'll post a link to it, but maybe let's see. And the essay was, the interview was published as Intellectuals in Power. And I can see if I can share the screen to show it to you. So here it is, Intellectual in Power, Intellectuals in Power. And uh, it's an interesting uh, essay because the questions that are being asked of uh, Deleuze and Foucault are the, and the answers that they give is what Spivak is responding to, okay? But there is a moment in this interview where Deleuze mentions, and remember Deleuze and Foucault had just come out of the prison reform protests, right? And what Deleuze is, says at one point in the essay that representation, there is no signifier anymore. Representation is no longer needed because people can speak for themselves because they had learned in their experiences that the prisoners exactly knew through their lived experiences as to what kind of reform they wanted. So the role of the intellectual was not to speak on their behalf or represent them but to learn from the people through their lived experiences and then become a relay between the prisoners and the rest of the world and the powers that be. So it's a role of intellectual that is at play and a sort of assertion that we as intellectuals no longer need to represent the people. Okay. Now, assumption behind that is that people can speak for themselves, right? So the main question in Can the Subaltern Speak, if you read it through and through after you have waded through theory, Derrida and Marx and everyone else, is whether or not the post-colonial intellectual can assume that the subaltern subjects can speak for themselves and hence abdicate his or her responsibility of representation, of speaking for, right? That kind of representation because Spivak distinguishes between two kinds of representations, standing in for in the artistic representation. We'll talk about that more. Now in this interview then, first of all, it's two Western intellectuals talking about Maoism. So the first, um, objection that Spivak have is, okay, here are these two European intellectual using the term Maoism, but which is very Eurocentric. You can't trace the original Maoism in it. It is the French version of Maoism. Then in the process of giving this interview, right, they are also unannouncedly, right, inhabiting this subjectivity, this privileged European subjectivity, not conscious of the global division of labor, okay, not worried about it at all because they are imagining their own experience as universal, right? And Spivak finds a problem with that as well. So her argument in the very beginning is that this interview, while critiquing the subject, in, inaugurates a new subject of the West, right? 
that there is no understanding of a general theory of ideology and global division of labor when these scholars are making their claims and that without that you can't talk about the global periphery right where things are happening so it's very eurocentric and most importantly why is it essential for the intellectual to not to give up on his or her responsibility to represent okay and hence can the subaltern speak the question is can we abdicate our responsibility by simply assuming that the subalterns have obtained political voice and we don't need to be in solidarity with them or represent them? That's the question that she's trying to answer. Now, also keep in mind that Spivak did revise this essay. A lot of people don't go and read it. And it's interwoven with her essay on Rani F. Simur in her book, a critique of post-colonial reason and on one of the pages you know she acknowledges that while talking about you know her earlier essay and talking about how uh, Bobanswari is still misrepresented by her own relatives she writes and I quote I was so unnerved by this failure of communication that in the first version of this text, which is Can the Subaltern Speak, I wrote in the accents of passionate lament, the subaltern cannot speak. It was an inadvisable remark, right? So the revision is there. Now she doesn't retract that idea that the subaltern cannot speak within the context of Deleuze and Foucault um, interview, but that correction is there. Right, and she acknowledges the work of people who criticize the essay by saying, can the subaltern vote, right? But all of it is contingent upon our understanding of subalternity itself, right? Here, Spivak in the original essay used a sort of strategic essentialism. That was her term, that the subaltern is a subaltern because he or she cannot speak, right? And if we assume that as intellectuals, as scholars, then we can take on the responsibility of working with the subalterns. Now, remember, in another uh, one of her works, uh, Spivak, you know, articulates what is the role of humanities. It's in the first chapter of Other Asia's, her other book. And she says that, you know, the role of humanities, one role is to train the imagination of our students at both ends of the global divide to teach our students over here how to think the world and to teach the students in the global periphery the habits and the ideas and the knowledge of democracy. So this is just my introductory lecture. I'll delve into the essay, of course, later, but I thought I should explain that she's responding to Deleuze and Foucault and certain claims that they make within the essay and the lack of a general theory of ideology in their essays, the European subjectivity that both of them uncritically inhabit, right? The Western version of Maoism. And then the main question, can we assume that people can speak for themselves? And if we do as post-colonial scholars, what is at stake? So this is the first lecture and I will come back with more. Hope you all will join me and if you like this uh, kind of work and what I offer, please do subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much and I will see you next time. Peace and love. Hello, welcome back. Today I'm going to attempt to record the second part of my lecture on Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? Now in the first part I had explained that this is an occasional essay and Spivak is responding to an interview by Deleuze and Foucault and that she has certain objections to some of the things that Deleuze and Foucault state. Today I'm going to use and try to use the text of the essay itself and try to go line by line and see if I can handle the first part of the essay. Now, uh, 
you are aware that there are four parts of the essay. Essay is uh, organized. There are four parts. Part one is a critique of the Foucault Deleuze interview, which I hope to cover in this lecture. Part two describes epistemic violence, the subaltern, and ends with the words on implications uh, of what will happen if we actually bought into what Deleuze and Foucault say and followed it as intellectual. Part three, she moves us into a discussion of Derrida in comparison to Foucault, because people often argue, she says, that Foucault writes about history and Derrida is ahistorical. What she's arguing is that the tools that Derrida gives us are actually more significant for people doing scholarship about the global periphery. And that's what she argues in part three. And the part four is kind of the meat of the her argument because she takes us through the discussion of sati, its codification under the colonial law, and the, towards her final example of Buon Sawari and her suicide. Right. These are the four parts of the essays. And at each stage, when I move from one part to the other, I'll try to explain as to why is she moving into a certain thought process. OK, but first and foremost, I would like to point out in this lecture, her main argument in the beginning of the essay and her main objections to the interview and why does she choose the interview? That's the intent in this part, and I hope I can do justice to it. And if you just look at the first line, you know, it tells us the whole project of this essay, because what she starts with is that some of the most radical criticism coming out of the West today is the result of an interested desire to conserve the subject of the West, or West as a subject. Let's unpack that. So this role played by the intellectuals maybe unintentionally ends up preserving the subject of the Western intellectual or West itself without any acknowledgement of the complicating factors coming from the developing world. So the idea is that the Western intellectual in the process of explaining things that could be relevant to the workers is actually constituting their own location in the West as normative and as maybe the only normative universal way of looking, looking at it without even knowing that they are doing that. The much publicized critique of the sovereign subject, she's talking now, thus actually inaugurates a subject. OK, so the critique of the sovereign subject is a Foucauldian thing, right? He is the one who talks about that we don't act as subjects, but we produce subject effects. So the profit of subject effects, Foucault, while talking about this particular subject in the interview, himself is inaugurating you know, a new subject of the West. And what does she argue? She says, I will argue for this conclusion by considering a text by two great practitioners. So, so this general tendency to create West as the subject, and the Western intellectual as the speaking subject, as the norm, she says, I will now read, I will now prove this point by reading an interview by two scholars who are the prophets so-called of the periphery, right? Foucault and Deleuze. And then she gives us the reason why she has chosen an interview instead of their long, you know, well thought out and planned works. She says, I've chosen this friendly exchange between two activist philosophers of history because it undoes the opposition between authoritative theoretical production and the unguarded practice of conversation, right? Thus enabling Spivak and others to trace the working of ideology, right? So the idea is 
that she's not reading their finished projects, which would be more deliberate and maybe would have less slippage of the ideology that has produced those two scholars. But to take this conversation, maybe informal, because it is informal and that informality allows a scholar like Spivak to read into it as to what is it that these two scholars are expressing ideologically without even knowing as to where their assumptions are coming from. It's like when she discusses later tracking the silences of the text, right? Foucault and Deleuze are not saying this is who we are. They are expressing it. The ideology is showing through that informal expression through a conversation. Okay, so then she goes on and tells us about the critique of the sovereign subject, of which, of course, Foucault is a part. But she says that there are two things that come across very clearly in this interview, right? That this is a conversation with the Maoists. And another thing that comes up in this conversation is the workers' struggle, right? Now, obviously, in this discussion with the French Maoists, what Spivak points out is that you can't trace the original Maoism in it. It's French Maoism, which has got nothing to do with Maoism coming from China. And it eventually becomes French new philosophy. And that these two scholars are also connecting their views to workers' struggle, which she says is a genuflection on the part of Deleuze. And why does she say that? Um, she quotes Deleuze here. She says, we are unable to touch power in any points of its application without finding ourselves confronted by this diffuse mass, mass so that we are necessarily led to the desire to blow it up completely. Every partial revolutionary attack or defense is linked in this way to the workers' struggle, right? And Spivak says this is probably not sincere because it's like a genuflection. She's talking about the workers' struggle, but they don't connect it to the actual workers' struggle in the world because in order to do that, these two intellectuals will have to incorporate in their thought process the global division of labor. That the workers' struggle is not uniform in France as well as in India and Bangladesh, right? That there is a global division of labor, right? And there are workers on the other end of the global divide who are caught within the web of capital who are exploited, who has have not gotten a chance of upward mobility to become part of the consumerist economy, right? And there is no way we can conflate the workers that Deleuze and Foucault are imagining with the workers on the other end of the global divide. So for these two scholars to make these claims, there is then an erasure of ideology itself that we cannot talk about the workers' struggle without a general theory of ideology and within that, without actually understanding the global division of labor. Now then she goes on on the next pages, and I'm trying to bring the next page uh, here is, uh, she gives us a further critique of what Deleuze and Foucault are arguing. And one of the things that they argue is that uh, in their interview is that theory is practice and practice is theory, right? And there is no signifier. What Spivak is then asking the question is that if that is so, right? And if desire leads us, and it doesn't lack anything according to Deleuze, right? It's not lack of its object. It is rather the subject that's lacking desire, right? That entire theory of desire by um, Deleuze. So how do you then track the presence of the West's other in that theory of desire? So what she's saying here is this may be the legal subject of socialized capital, neither labor nor management holding a strong passport 
using a strong or hard currency with supposedly unquestioned access to due process. It is certainly not the desiring subject as others. So, so the, the other or the desiring subject that Deleuze is theorizing and talking about cannot necessarily be universalized. And it certainly cannot be the desiring subject as the other, right? Because that subject cannot move about in the world with the freedom and facility in which the subject that Deleuze is theorizing moves about, right? We have to understand the existence of the other and we can only understand it if we think of ideology and think of the global division of labor. Okay. Uh, furthermore, she goes into, uh, you know, there is a certain disavowal of ideology in the interview. But the question that she's also asking is the question about representation and that she brings up on page 71, okay? And they, then she says that, okay, at one point, Deleuze's argument is that, um, you know, there is no more representation. And I'm quoting is, there is nothing but action, action of theory and action of practice which relate to each other as relays of networks, right? And what Deleuze is arguing is that the intellectual becomes transparent, right? And a relay, people know what they want. They relay to the intellectual and the intellectual relays it forward, right? There is, um, Spivak is saying, there is not even a critical understanding of what is being relayed. The, the critic has taken away that role itself, right? But then she goes into and saying, okay, what kind of representation are they talking about? If they are saying there is no representation, right? There are two possible definitions of representation. And those are Voltraiton, right? Represent in the first sense, right? Where you stand in for someone, you represent someone, maybe politically and other, and then their tail right? Representation in pictorial form in art, right? And what she is saying is that you can't think that they both are the same, right? And in order for us to understand the global division of labor, we have to be very careful in defining what do we even mean by representation. And obviously, she takes us to Mark, Marx, because he's the one who's theorizing class, right? And class to him is people who share the same kind of lived experience, but are cut off from other classes. But class is never natural, right? It, it is constructed because of the socioeconomic conditions in which people exist. And if we are talking about representation of class, it will be Vertraiton, right? Someone standing in for them. And she goes to, you know, the famous essay, the 18th Boromir of Louis Bonaparte, where Marx discussing the question of class, right? And uh, especially for the Jewish citizens of France. And then in this part one, after she had discussed, and the reason she's discussing Marx here is because she's giving us how Marx theorizes class and that that understanding of class is crucial. And the distinction between two kinds of representations is crucial if Deleuze and Foucault are going to argue that representation has withered away, right? Um, so further in this part, towards the end of it, you know, uh, what she says is, and I, I quote, she says, my view is that radical practice should attend to this double session of representation. It should know about world trade and but also does trail, right? And Marx himself, she says, rehearses an ancient subterfuge in the concept of uh, what that what Marx himself rehearses, and that post-structuralists by erasing these this distinction, right? Then then they can claim there is no sign structure operating experience, and 
does that mean she says we lay semiotics to rest if there is no need of representation right what kind of representation is it but then what is the role of the intellectual right then she on page 75 of my text she goes on to discuss said right and said's insistence and critique of foucault where said basically is talking about the importance of the intellectual and his or her role right and 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 the reason she's taking us to said is to assert that the intellectual should not abdicate his or her role of representing especially the other of your right um, and then what will happen she uses the term other as the self shadow i shall return to this argument Short, shortly she says but uh, but this if these french intellectuals can claim that representation has withered away it has died right the people can speak for themselves and they can offer these solutions normatively and almost universally right what is at stake first of all that the intellectuals need not to represent the people represent in standing in for right and two that everyone is constructed in the shadow of this self that is speaking right right and so the the other of europe then is constructed in the shadow of this european self right and if we do that then we have to elide this entire lopsided global division of labor and can we actually do that right that's her question in this part that if we assume that representation is no longer necessary or no longer needed what kind of representation are we talking about if we are saying that the desire leads a person to the interest where it lies whose desire are we talking about does this desire include the desire of the global other of europe the person on the other end of global divide right and that if we leave this question unattended aren't we creating the other of europe in its own shadow without even knowing that it could have a different subjectivity a different existence a different politics right so the question then at the end of this section it, it is what she's saying is that let's query into that right let's question the question of a general ideology global division of labor and let's question the claims that these intellectuals are making on the plane of class but also global division of labor in which the views of these two privileged european intellectuals that are being offered as definitive stance on representation and signification and role of the intellectuals what would be at stake if we i mean the developing world intellectuals the third world intellectuals the post colonialists uncritically bought into it and believed that people or subalterns can speak for themselves and there is no need for us to represent them so that is the groundwork that she is laying down in part 1 of can the subaltern speak right and now you know i know i've not done a good job of explaining it but i was trying to go line by line so with this brief knowledge and my Conclu concluding thoughts on it we will then move on to part 2 of the essay as i explained and see if we can understand her argument better right how does she make her point remember she's trying to prove in the very beginning of this essay that in the process of discussing the subject a new practice is happening in post structuralism and that is the solidification of the subject of europe and europe as a subject itself the interview that is using is an example of how it happens and the critique is why is it necessary to challenge that creation of 
Europe as a subject or the subject of Europe as an intellectual. I hope this was helpful to you and I'll soon come back with part three of my um, attempt at trying to discuss can the subaltern speak. Until then, thank you so much and peace and love. I'm back again with uh, my third lecture on Spivax, Can the Subaltern Speak? Now, if you have watched my previous two lectures, the first was an introduction to the background materials, especially to the Foucault Deleuze interview that Spivak is responding to. In the second lecture, I explained the organization of the essay and then covered part one in which Spivak lays out her arguments against certain statements that Deleuze and Foucault make. In this section of my series of lectures, I'll be talking about part two of the essay. And uh, it's a very important part because this is where she elaborates on the groundwork that she had done previously. Okay. And here is where she ends um, the first part of the, the last paragraph of part one is, uh, and I'm gonna share it on a larger screen so that you can watch it. Uh, what she shares it, here is the last paragraph of the part one. And it says, however reductionist and economic analysis uh, these intellectuals forget at their own peril that the entire overdetermined enterprise was in the interest of a dynamic economic situation. So this is Spivak basically suggesting to Foucault and Deleuze, Deleuze and the readers of that interview is that as they are talking about that there is no longer representation, what they are forgetting is that the system Right, which remains unannounced in their saying was colonialism and colonialism was a system that generates and creates certain epistemology, right? And creates the other of Europe, right? The question is how is the other of Europe created and stabilized, right? So the main project of colonialism for Spivak was that epistemologically and through other policies, through law, the colonies were created as a subject or as a space as other of Europe, right? As the dark shadow of Europe against which Europe could exist as a more civilized or uh, a so-called more organized civilization, right? So the... Next thing that she talks about, she on the next page, she goes on to explaining what she means. This is the beginning of part two, what she means by epistemic violence, right? And she starts with the clearest available example of such epistemic violence is the remotely orchestrated, far-flung and heterogeneous project to constitute the colonial subject as other, right? And she, will dwell on this in part two. Okay, so the colonial subject as other is absolutely necessary for the colonial system to exist because Europeans must cre create this other in order to sustain their own identity, uh, identities. And within that, while referring to Foucault, she's saying, okay, there is a lecture by Foucault, remember in one of his lecture series, towards the end of his career when he starts giving public lectures where Foucault talks about buried knowledges, right? Uh, the unacknowledged knowledge and the role of the intellectual. Uh, otherwise, our job is to, what if we could bring out that knowledge and juxtapose it with, it with the scientific knowledge or with knowledge that claims to be normative, right? And Foucault calls this buried knowledge as bruised knowledge. And the purpose is to bring it face to face with the mainstream knowledge and its scientificity, and then complicate the discursive world that that established knowledge has created, right? And she's saying, okay, Mr. Foucault, right? 
let's read this constitution of colonial subject as other. Let's read it within the paradigm of your own theory of, uh, you know, uh, this knowledge that doesn't form part of your or Deleuze's perception or background. But can we retrieve that knowledge and talk about it? And can we do ret retrieve the acts of epistemic violence and how they structure the colonial system and how we can track their presence even now as these two intellectuals are speaking about workers' struggle as a universal struggle within its Eurocentricity. So how does then she trace that epistemic violence, right? She goes to one aspect of how the British kind of codified their presence in India, right? And that is through codification of Hindu law, right? So she says, let us consider briefly the underpinnings of the British codification of Hindu law, right? While she's doing that, she also once again criticizes Foucault and Deleuze's insistence on the concrete experience, right? As the chief arbiter of truth. Now remember in their interview, Foucault and Deleuze are saying, hey, we worked with these prisoners. And most of the times the prisoners, their bodies were experiencing the jails, right? And they knew their own condition and they told us what they wanted, right? So they were they are privileging concrete experience over theory or over a theoretical understanding of the world. And what through Marx, what Spivak is saying is, what is at stake if we privilege simply that concrete experience itself in its pure form can inform the people of their living conditions, right? That there is no ideology that is tracked in there, that, that the, what, the, what the insistence on concrete experience then suggests is contra altusser, that we can exist outside of ideology and somehow can touch the real, right? And that's why she inserts here too, is why she is suspicious of concrete experience as the chief arbiter of truth, right? And then she also, now remember, you can't skim Spivak, right? And Spivak is a very careful scholar. She doesn't leave you many places to point out where she doesn't cover her own statements, doesn't provide a justification for them. So she knows that she is going to the an Indian example. How did the British codify the Hindu law? But she also knows, and she says so in this part, that in, in North America, because of the culturalist emphasis, People might think, oh, here she goes again, you know, giving us examples from her cultural specificity from India. And she, what her reason is, she says, look, I wasn't trained in the West. I got most of my education in India. And the reason I go to Indian materials, one of the reasons is that, you know, that's what I know the best. But what she's also clarifying is that she doesn't go there in a nativist way to prove that somehow the Indian materials are better. And she also clarifies in this section that what she's going to talk about the codification of Hindu law within the colonial episteme of violence or epistemic violence, even in post-colonial studies, is not generalizable to other colonized parts of the world. So she's very specific and she's also teaching us in the process that we should not take her insights and apply them ipso facto as universal truth to all the colonial situations, right? And she's very carefully pointing that out over here. And we ought to keep that in mind. So uh, then she explains to us the complexity of Hindu law, right? How did it work? So it had a four part episteme, Sruti, Smithri, Sastra and, uh, and Vyavahara, right? I hope I'm saying them right. So it was first, you know, whether uh, a tradition or a custom, was it heard 
was it remembered was it learned from another and was it performed in exchange these are the four levels on which the hindu sacred texts were read and interpreted right so when the british codify the hindu law the question that she is posing is do they simplify it you know according to their own meaning making processes or are they aware of this subtlety and this complexity within the hindu tradition itself of how things are interpreted how laws are made now she will eventually go on to discuss it further but in this part what she is talking about is how is the colonial subject cre created as europe's other so a summary of that is is the british treatment of sati which is called widow immolation right and what she is arguing and she will further clarify it in another section is that codification of hindu law according to british british especially the practice of sati it was flattened so that what people in england could think of was oh here look at these people they burn the widows on their altar right and that codification in the indian context then the, that is the first major legislation announced by it you will not burn widows right but it creates this image of india of hindus right as these people why are we there or oh, we will not let them burn the widows anymore so it, it represents this idea the practice of sati as inscribed in hindu scripture and as rampant everywhere right and spivak eventually explains to us i mean it was not practiced so widely it was mostly upper class women um, also there were other forms of self emulation like a thing a practice called johar which the rajputs practiced my people and spivak is also critical of the native uh, you know hindu nationalist who proposed that as this valor act of valor or this idea from the native culture coming that maybe the widows did want to kill themselves right but the codification of hindu law she also points out i think in the next part also is that there is an ambivalence even in the sacred texts right and i will cite that verse where she goes and that the interpreters of the sacred texts misread that but then the british are also misreading this practice right and and under the garb of saving the widows from brown men right white men saving brown women from brown men the codification flattens the understanding of sati but then also creates this indian other which can be reduced to a european audience and so it becomes part of the project of you know colonialism project in a sense that now they can justify on one other account this is what we are trying to do in india i mean people kill widows right they burn them at the altar now think of that argument white men saving brown women from brown men has been mobilized so many times in our own lifetimes invasion of iraq invasion of afghanistan right just remember before the U us invasion of afghanistan what were we seeing on cnn i remember this entire show on women clad in burqas right what the taliban were doing to them right and so the narrative maybe unannounced was these are the women we are trying to liberate saving them from brown men not realizing that during the clinton admi administration before bush united states was working with the taliban while they were committing all those atrocities and they, the the clinton administration officials at times gave a culturalist defense of the taliban that we they need to do what they need to do within the logic of their own culture that that was happening under the 
power of America and their connected interest with a stable Afghanistan. Same with Iraq, right? When Bush, Mr. Bush wants to go and liberate Iraqi people, this was the same Saddam Hussein who was implanted by United States. But suddenly the narrative there is also to save brown women from brown men. But if you look at the US interests abroad, Saudi Arabia is a great example of it. No one wants to go and liberate Saudi women, right? Um, but the narrative, this narrative, she will talk about it a little more uh, further of white men saving brown women and codification of Hindu sati laws was a great example of that, how the British saw it, how they represented it, and how they legislated it. But part of that legislation was to create this other whom you are trying to control by law, right? So um, she goes on then to, you know, the question of from there, she is taking us now to, to the question of the subaltern itself. Because remember, the essay's title is Can the Subaltern Speak? Right? And on page 78, she poses this question. And this is posed to Foucault and Deleuze, who are arguing that the subaltern, the people, can speak for themselves. And she's saying, OK. After this colonial epistemic violence, of which you don't account for or say nothing about, we must now confront the following question. On the other side of the international div division of labor from socialized capital, right? This is what she had pointed out, that there is a global division of labor. Inside and outside the circuit of the epistemic violence of imperial law and education, supplementing an earlier economic text, can the subaltern speak? The earlier economic text being, I think, the Marxist understanding of economy. But she says, you guys are saying that the subaltern can speak, right? You're universalizing it. But if we read the figure of the subaltern within the international division of labor, right, without the ability to become part of the mainstream economy through consumerization, right? Let's see, can the subaltern speak, right? She locates this subaltern figure, right? As she's already told us, she's going to go to India. Right? And then she provides us a discussion of the subaltern studies group, right? Now, subaltern studies collective arguably is one of the most prominent group of historians and writers who have produced about 10 volumes of works who argue that the Indian national historiography is too elite centric. And that they go and retrieve the silenced histories of the subaltern groups, right? And in the process of doing so, she gives on one of the pages a gradation of subaltern groups that they create, right? And what happens in creating those lists of subaltern groups is that a group can be a subaltern group in one region and be a dominant group in, a, in another region, right? And also in the process, they are assuming a, some sort of an essentialized subaltern subject, right? And Spivak provides us quite a lot of detail about the subaltern studies project. Um, and I'm quoting here from page 80, she says that the regional and local levels, the dominant integer, if belonging to social strata hierarchically inferior to those of the dominant all Indian groups still acted in the interest of the latter and not in conformity to the interest corresponding truly to their own social being. So when these writers speaks in their essentializing language, she's talking about the subaltern studies group of a gap between interest and action in the intermediate group. Now, this is a group that's neither dominant nor subaltern. It's in between, right? And they're speaking of where their interest lies, which is a Marxian reading of interest, right? Their conclusions are closer to Marx. 
Marx, right? Because like, let's say when Marx defines where would the petite bourgeois fall. So in the last instance, he thinks that their interest would lie with the proletariat, right? So they are theorizing, even though they're essentializing the subaltern groups or someone, who, someone who's in between, and they realize that their interest is still connected to the dominant group. They are theorizing it not through desire, but through their class interest, right? What she's saying is, Marx then to the self-conscious naivete of Deleuze's pronouncement on the issue, which he says, you know, people can speak for themselves. Guha, that is Ranajit Guha, like Marx, speaks of interest in terms of the social rather than desire, rather than the libidinal being. The name of the father imagery in the 18th Boromir can help to emphasize that. Remember, she has already discussed Marx and how the Jewish citizens whom Louis Napoleon had given the citizenship rights claim Napoleon to be the father figure so that he could represent themselves. That's the name of the father. Uh, so what she is saying here is that the subaltern studies group, even though they essentialize the subaltern and, and do sometimes refer to the pure consciousness of the subaltern, subaltern, which is a question whether that can be retrieved and represented, their articulation of subaltern's interest is materialistic and Marxist, right? And maybe more useful to us within the colonial context than assuming that their desire leads them to their interest, as Deleuze suggests, right? Next, she moves on to So, so after she has done this, right, um, after she has theorized the subaltern and discussed the subaltern studies group, what she proposes at the end of this section, and I'm going to go there, is, and I'm going to read it. Um, she again criticizes Foucault, but before that she gives, you know, um, an account of how to do materialistic readings, but towards the end of section two, she suggests, and I read, sometimes it seems as if the very brilliance of Foucault's analysis of the centuries of European imperialism produces a miniature version of that heterogeneous phenomena, management of space, but by doctors, development of administrations, but in the asylums, considerations of the periphery, but in the terms of the insane prisoners and children, the clinic, the asylum, the prison, the university, all seem to be screen allegories that foreclose a reading of the broader narratives of imperialism, right? One could open a sm similar discussion of the fact ferocious motives of deterritorialization, ter that is a dig at Deleuze. Yet we have already spoken of the sanctioned ignorance that every critic of imperialism must chart. So before she gets to this conclusion and moves on to part three, right, where she talks about Derrida, the account that she gives us is then um, of the, I mean, there's a critique of pure consciousness. I, sorry, I'd missed these slides. Um, she talks about also reading the silences of her text, right? And this comes from Pierre McCary. Uh, it's not what a text doesn't say, but any text, Deleuze and Foucault's text, let's say their interview, reading the silences of the text isn't that what they refuse to say, but it would be what they take for granted. Right, what they think that the listeners or readers will be privy to, right? And actually, a brilliant example of reading the sciences, uh, silences of a text is also um, uh, Althusser's uh, reading uh, about reading Marx, right? Reading Capital, where he talks about, okay, I'm going to read in this what Marx doesn't explain, what he takes for granted as something that everyone would be privy to. So here, 
Um, through Pierre McCary, what she's suggesting is that the, the reading, the silences of Deleuze and Foucault's interview is, is the things that they do not say. And the main thing that they do not say is the history of imperialism, right? And the current regime of imperialism, which is America-centric, right? And within that, nation states have a certain client status. And the global division of labor emerges in this new post-war order after the fall of Soviet Union. I don't think so. Soviet Union had fallen then. But, but this new order in which regimes and governments are not sovereign in themselves, but they align themselves with the United States and function within that regime of capital, that Europe and Britain and France also function within that, and that all remains unsaid. The trace of that imperial ideology that's at work, right? Also, what she's talking about in this section is, um, and that's the conclusion, is that Deleuze and Foucault, they talk about immigrants towards the end of that interview. And they talk about exploitation of immigrant workers, right? But they only become part, a subject of their discussion because they have entered the metropolitan space. The only time the global other of Europe enters the imagination and conversation of Foucault and Deleuze is when they are already there, right? Their rights within France, right? And they are equated with all the other people who cannot be represented because they can speak for themselves. But what she's saying is that what doesn't enter, what is what remains silenced in this conversation is the colonized other, the, the other who is still under the imperial regimes of power, works within global division of labor, is exploited labor, right? So there is no acknowledgement of this other elsewhere because they are imagining the European worker, the European French prisoner as the ultimate subaltern subject. So the conclusion to part two then, uh, if I read it carefully, right, is sometimes it seems as if the very brilliance of Foucault's analysis of the centuries of European imperialism produces a miniature version of that heterogeneous phenomena, management of space, but by doctors, development of administrations, but in asylums. This is a catalog of Foucault's work. The clinic, the asylum, the prison, the university, all seem to be screen allegories, right? That foreclose a reading of the broader narratives of imperialism. Right. So at the end of this section, having discussed how one project of colonial epistemic violence was to create the colonized other as the other of Europe, right? How that was done through not just education that she talks about the educational system, but also through law and codification of law. And she gives us the example of the codification of British law against Sati. And then that we all exist in this neo-imperial order implemented by United States with its power in which every state or some states have client status, right? And through Pierre McCary teaching us about how to read the silences of a text, things that a text does not acknowledge, but are constitutive parts of it, right? She reads then the interview as a disavowal, as a silencing of the very bruised knowledge that Foucault retrieves elsewhere. And that bruised, bruised knowledge is the significance of global division of labor. Within that, the space of the formerly colonized but still subjugated subaltern subject of the non-West. Inscribed within that also is a discussion of the apps of retrieval by the subaltern studies group of the narratives of subaltern groups and how their reading, even though essentialized, is closer 
too, what could be more plausible because they are doing a materialistic reading of it and not a desire-based libidinal reading of the subaltern groups. Now from here, she's already kind of hinted at how she will theorize the subaltern itself and how she will read it. The purpose always being to answer the one question that is the title of the essay and that is, can the subaltern speak? And this was part three. I am pretty sure I missed a lot and maybe lost my way in the process, but I hope this is useful to you. I will come back in a few days with part four of this lecture. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, if you would like me to answer some things that I might have misread or not mentioned in my reading of part two of Spivak's essay, do let me know in the comment section and I will address those. Thank you so much for joining me in this perilous venture as I've called it. And I will see you next time with my next lecture. Until then, thank you and peace and love. Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today in my series on Gayatri Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak, one that I've called A Perilous Journey, I will be talking about part three of Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Now, if you have watched my previous videos, there are three lectures already on the same topic Towards the end of the third lecture, Spivak, who starts her discussion by critiquing Foucault and Deleuze's interview, by challenging their, some, some of their assumptions, but most importantly, their assumptions about uh, the concrete experience of the subaltern subject and that the subalterns can express themselves, the question of representation, of class, of global division of labor, but in the process of critiquing Foucault especially and Deleuze to some extent, what she also points out is that in the process of making their pronouncements, Foucault and Deleuze, they also constitute a speaking subject of the West. You know, after all, if everything is discursive, where does Foucault speak from? That's the question. But that through a disavo, Right, by universalizing human subjectivity and the voice of the subaltern, which is relayed through the intellectual, what she is saying is that what it does is it makes Europe as the subject and the speaking subject of Europe assimilates the other within his or her own pronouncements. And this knowing of the other through assimilation, I mean, there is a Hegelian lineage for that too. If you think of the Hegelian ego, the Hegelian subject who seeks its other, right? What does it do to the other? It consumes it, right? To know the other, you must make it a part of yourself. You must consume it so that you can move on, right? That's how knowledge or the way we think of it works. And so in this section, she says, okay, in the American Academy, there are certain existing unannounced prejudices when it comes to Foucault and Derrida. Most people assume that Derrida moves us into the text, that's Said, right? And Foucault moves us in and out of the text. But the general belief is in the, that Foucault deals with history and historicizes his work whereas Derrida is ahistorical, apolitical, right, and too complex. And she's offering this section, section not as a defense of Derrida, after all, Derrida doesn't need anyone's defense, but to suggest that for those of us who do post-colonial studies, those of us who call ourselves the post-colonialists who deal with the so-called others of Europe, probably Derrida is more significant 
as a scholar and philosopher, not because he leads us to answers, no. But what he does is, in the project of dismantling Eurocentricity itself, is crucial. So how does she lay down this argument? I'll be reading from the text itself and then, you know, offering my humble uh, explanations. Uh, so what she says is this paper, I mean, can the subaltern speak, is committed to the notion that whether in defense of Derrida or not, a nostalgia for lost origins can, can be detrimental to the exploration of social realities within the critique of imperialism. Okay. Uh, so this is one of the critiques of Derrida, but part of it is also a critique of post-colonial studies, and that is, you know, thinking for those originary moments or seeking the origins, right? And I will discuss, she says, a, a few aspects of Derrida's work that retain a long-term usefulness for people outside the first world. And where she's citing from is this uh, from of grammatology, and it's the chapter three of grammatology as a positive science. That's where Derrida explains the possibilities of grammatology, but also what it cannot do. And what she says is, um, this is not an apology for Derrida. She's like, Derrida is hard to read. His real object of investigation is classical philosophy. That's what he challenges and, you know, tries to dismantle. Yet he's less dangerous when understood. This is a very important thing. He is less dangerous when understood than the first world intellectual masquerading as the absent non-representer who lets the oppressed speak for themselves. I mean, that's a huge indictment of Foucault and Deleuze, right? What she's saying is that compared to if we buy into what Deleuze and Foucault are saying ipso facto without thinking critically of it, Derrida is less dangerous if understood, quite dangerous if not understood. And why? And she says, I will dis discuss this chapter from off chromatology to prove my point. And the question she's addressing is, the question is how to keep the ethnocentric subject from establishing itself by selectively defining the other, which she thinks that Foucault does, maybe without knowing it, right? But does establish Europe and then the other, the colonial other, and all those on the fringes of it through a simulation, right? Because when Deleuze and Foucault are saying people can speak for themselves, they are universalizing it, right? They, they are universalizing it to the point where they don't even acknowledge that there can be people on the other end of the global divide maybe who cannot speak for themselves, right? Or that concrete experience without ideology how do we understand it? All these questions are coming up. But coming back to this essay, um, Derrida admits that he cannot ask the first questions that must be answered to establish the grounds of his argument, right? Um, there is no place for him to start the first questions, right? But he points out that, you know, grammatology can also not answer all questions, but in the process of discussing, He uh, declares that there were three kind of prejudices operative in European philosophy and ways of thinking, right? And she, he calls them the theological prejudice, the Chinese prejudice, and hieroglyphist prejudice. Now, this will all make sense as I move a little bit. And what he's saying is uh, that what the philosophers in Europe at that time believed Okay, so the theological prejudice was that here is the Judeo-Christian Bible and it's a written text. It can be read, it can be consumed, right? The Chinese prejudice was that Chinese 
is an ideal language because it represents things in these pictographs, but that's what it is. It's ideal, right? And it can be reduced to words. And if, the, if, if it... understand it better. But it still privileges the theological prejudice about the written text, right? And the third is uh, the hieroglyphic prejudice where uh, Egyptian or the classical um, script, Egyptian script, was considered great, but it was too sublime. It could not really be understood. So what we are then, after all, we've gone through these, what it ends up doing is it ends up privileging at the cost of the others the logocentrism, right? The privileging of written texts of the texts that are essentially European and within that Judo-Christian, right? These are the three major prejudices that he talks about. Uh, so when, what she says is Derrida gives us two solutions in of grammatology to, to dispel this prejudice, this privileging of Europe, right? And what he does is, uh, so he gives us two characteristic possibilities for solutions to the problem of the European subject, which seeks to produce an other, like the Egyptian and Chinese. In critiquing, critiquing the production of the colonial subject, what he says is he says that 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 what Derrida says in his own act of reading, he's trying to conserve something, and that is the other, right, in his own thinking process, but it is ineffable. It cannot really be expressed. But what she says is, in critiquing, critiquing the production of colonial subjects, this ineffable, non-transcendental place is detected by the subaltern subject. Okay, what does she mean by that? Okay, first we need to understand cathectation. So cathectation is when you, me, or anyone else looks at something, right? But then cathects it, desires it through the vision of another, through someone whom we consider better than us or we consider superior to us. So in the colonial history, um, her concept of wording depends on cathectation. So what she tells us about is that famous story of Captain Birch riding through the Indian landscape with his local attendant. Now the local attendant, right, while he is traveling with the master, cathects the local world from the point of view of the master, right, starts seeing it as the master sees, but also sees it as not his native space, but a space controlled by this white guy on a horse who can ride through it without him. That's an act of cathectation. When you invest your desires in the actions and privileges of the po those more powerful than you, right? And the, this silencing of the native subject, right, is in the native cultures is then read through that, through that act of cathectation. How do we undo that? Okay. So what what she says is, you know, how how do we undo this problem of European subjects' desire to understand the other through assimilation and not just as other who can exist in his or her right. So how can Derrida help us do that? Um, because Derrida, it is in the interest of such cautions that Derrida does not invoke letting the other speak for himself, right? But rather invokes an appeal to or call to the quiet other right, of rendering delirious that interior voice that is the voice of the other in us. So the idea is, let us not assume that this other can speak for his or himself, right? 
but let us acknowledge that as we are making our pronouncements, right, this other is a part of us, right, part of our speech act or the discourse, but is silenced or is silent, right? Now, the work of a post-colonialist then would be to go and find those silences, right, in texts, in historiography. How does a discourse structure itself through by assimilating its others. And then if you are really a post-colonialist, can you go and tease those silences out? That is what, in a way, she, when she quotes Pierre McCary and brings it forward, is th through Derrida the idea of reading what is in if what a text doesn't say, a historical text doesn't say, what it doesn't speak of, or what it is made to speak through imperial vocabularies. The work of the post-colonialist to go and do that, to read that silence, right? And, and that is why she says Derrida is useful, because Derrida nowhere acknowledges that he can stand at the beginning of asking all questions. He never tries to assume that the other can be under understood through assimilation, and that his project is to dismantle specifically the Eurocentricity of European thought. And so there is also a discussion of his critique of the presence, right? Presence in terms of speech and its privileging, right? That if I am here, and that's what Derrida dismantles, that you know, writing can be speech, right? But the critique of the presence also is the historical, philosophical understanding of presence. How did the Greeks define presence, right, in relation to a past and a future, but in the process of doing so, because they were plotting it on time, the present itself was privileged, right? And so if the present is privileged, whose present is privileged? Think of it when we think of the world, right? It's the metropolitan present that is privileged. So how can we undo that? Maybe we can invoke different temporalities, but Derrida creates a space for that. But I'm going to read her concluding paragraph. I'm pretty sure you're as confused as I am, but I hope this helps. So the concluding paragraph of this section is, Whatever the reasons for this specific absence, what I find useful is the sustained and developing work on the mechanics of the constitution of the other, right? And that Foucault does too. How is the other constructed? We can use it to much greater analytic and interventionist advantage than in invocations of the authenticity of the other, so no nativism. Right? On this level, what remains useful in Foucault is the mechanics of disciplinarization and institutionalization, the constitution, as it were, of the colonizer, right? Because Foucault is pretty good at studying the asylum, whatever is happening in Europe, right? How the institutions are shaping that. But Foucault never goes to the colonies, right? Even when he's in Iran writing about Iranian revolution, he can't see it from the Iranian point of view, right? He reduces it through his understanding of a revolution. Uh, Foucault does not relate it to any version, early or late, proto or post, of imperialism they are of great usefulness to intellectuals concerned with the decay of the West. Right? Their seduction for them and fearfulness for us is that they might allow the complicity of the investigating subject, male or female professional, to disguise itself in transparency. Right? So while Foucault and Deleuze are claiming that the subalterns can speak for themselves. They are also saying that the figure of the intellectual becomes transparent, right? Re is rendered transparent so that what the people are saying can pass through it and the intellectuals become a relay, right? But, but what we also know that in the process of saying that, Foucault and Deleuze both are, are, are speaking from Eurocentric subject positions. And 
and the other that they mention is never really theorized and never really talked about. And what Derrida does is, by constantly invoking philosophies other, written texts other, right? And by constantly saying, I cannot speak for the other, but the other is part of me, part of who I am, what it enables the post-colonial scholars then is, instead of relying on discourse and Foucault and that totally Eurocentric model of understanding the other, maybe take Derrida and his way of reading a text, a text of history, but also histories, others, and make the silences maybe, you know, ethical. I don't know. But that is what is the significance of Derrida that she's highlighting over here. Now, she will move with this technique then to read, you know, specific silences in India of the codification of Hindu law and then towards the end of the essay. But to conclude, keep in mind this originally started as a critique of Foucault and Deleuze's interview and their unacknowledged Eurocentric assumptions. We have now moved through Marx and Derrida to train ourselves as post-colonial scholars as to what is at stake if we buy into any of these assumptions, but why acknowledging that we need to acknowledge for the other without assimilating it, right? But as a constant presence, how can Derrida help us do that? And that she will actually do in the next section. That is all for right now. I hope this was useful and I hope this made sense to you. If it didn't, uh, please send me your questions and I will be happy to answer it. I will see you next time. Until then, peace and love. Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja and in today's conversation, I would like to offer my final installment in my series on Gayatri Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? Now, remember the essay has four parts, but my lecture series has five parts, and this is part five of the series. The reason it has five parts is because I spent the first part in discussing the Foucault Deleuze interview to which Spivak is responding in Can the Subaltern Speak? Now, before I go into the final section of the essay, let's kind of revise what she has argued until this point. So she starts with declaring that she is intentionally choosing an interview of Foucault and Deleuze to read critically because, in her words, it makes it easier for her to track the working of ideology because the expression is spontaneous and not an edited work. So that's her first declaration. Another thing that she clarifies is that this interview and the way these intellectuals speak also inaugurates a new subject of the West. And what she means by that is a subject of the West who speaks in the name of oppressed people, but in the process of doing so, colonizes the voices of the oppressed people and claims or at least suggests that all the subalterns in the world have similar living conditions and similar struggles. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind because she is critiquing that. And then one charge that she lays against Foucault and Deleuze is this idea that they assume that they can tackle the subject of the people and the subaltern without acknowledging the global division of labor and how capitalism works, right? They assume that living conditions are the same and within that for Deleuze and Foucault, people can speak for themselves. So the main question in this essay is, can we assume as scholars that the subaltern subjects can speak for themselves and hence no longer need representation? And what are the consequences of making this assumption and believing in it? Then she goes through a discussion of representation itself, right? And she famously then tells us there are two kinds of 
representations like Doris Trelan and Warwitho, right? I, I'm totally killing the German here, but one is representation as in art, right, as in pictorial representation, and the other is representation as in standing in for someone else, political representation. That is why she goes to discuss Marx, because Marx in that particular essay is addressing the question of the peasant workers who had been given the right to be political constituency but do not necessarily constitute a class, and how do they go about seeking representation, right? Then she gave us a section on Derrida, and her reason for discussing Derrida, and the reason she claims that Derrida is the best of the ethical philosophers, is because what she's trying to assert is that Derrida does not jumble together all the subalterns under one register. And Derrida doesn't assimilate the other in the process of discussing it, right? Derrida is an ethical philosopher because in his writing the other is always there, present, as a constitutive element of, the, of a self. So he doesn't erase the other in order to make certain claims. So overall then, by the time we reach the fourth and final part of the essay, what she has taught us is that there is a global division of labor in which those who live on the global periphery have a different kind of experience. That ideology plays a role in it, and we need to understand a general theory of ideology. That capitalism works differently in the global periphery. And the question still remains, can the subaltern speak for his or herself, or does the intellectual the post-colonial intellectual has a responsibility to its others, but also to the subaltern subjects. That is the question that she is going to address over here, and she will do that by discussing Freud, by discussing uh, British rule in India, but especially codification of the laws of Sati, and their codification of what they called the widow emulation. So there is a discussion of that, and then she makes this strategic move to show us one instance of a suicide which was dealt differently before she reaches her final conclusion. Now please keep in mind, as I mentioned in my earlier conversations, that she does go and revise this essay in her book, um, A Critique of Postcolonial Reason, where she merges Can the Subaltern Speak with Rani of Simur, and I highly recommend that you should read that in order to grasp a better understanding of it. Now, there is a lot of philosophical work and references that she does in part four. I will occasionally try to explain these, but one thing to keep in mind is to read the footnotes, because the footnotes are very instructive throughout the essay, but in this part of the essay. And what I'll do for better clarity and a better discussion is I will, at times, bring up the actual text, read a passage, and then try to unpack it. Overall, my hope is that after you have gone through all the five videos on Can the Subaltern Speak, your understanding of it would be a bit more expansive and nuanced. So here we go about it. Can the Subaltern Speak? What must the elite do to watch out for the continuing construction of the subaltern? The question of woman seems most problematic in this context. Clearly, if you are poor, black, and female, you get it three ways. If, however, this formulation is moved from the first world context into the post-colonial, which is not identical with the third world context, the description black or of color loses persuasive significance. The necessary stratification of colonial subject constitution in the first phase of capitalist imperialism makes color useless as an emancipatory signifier. Confronted by the ferocious standardizing benevolence of most US and Western European human scientific radicalism recognition by assimilation, the progressive 
though heterogeneous withdrawal of consumerism in the comprador periphery and the exclusion of the margins of even the center periphery articulation, the true and differential subaltern, the analog of class consciousness rather than race con consciousness in this area seems historically, disciplinarily, and practically forbidden by right and left alike. It is not just a question of a double displacement, as it is not simply the problem of finding a, a psychoanalytic allegory that can accommodate the third world woman with the first. The caution I have just expressed are valid only if we are speaking of the subaltern woman's consciousness or, more acceptably, subject. Reporting on, or better still, participating in anti-sexist work among women of color or women in class oppression in the first world or the third world is undeniably on the agenda. We should also welcome all the information retrieval in these silenced areas that is taking place in anthropology, political science, history, and sociology. Yet the assumption and construction of a consciousness or subject sustains such work and will in the long run cohere with the work of imperialist subject constitution. Mingling epistemic violence with the advancement of learning and civilization and the subaltern woman will be as mute as ever. Okay, so a bit of a cautionary note before I delve into my understanding of the passages that I just read. Most of what she's doing here in section four in the beginning is laying her groundwork of intervention. So she's first doing some negative work. And what do I mean by that? The negative work of teaching us as to why certain tools are not useful enough in speaking about the voice of the subaltern, right? So she first tells us that the usual designations and vocabularies of racial politics, feminist and other within the metropolitan cultures cannot capture, so to speak, the description or the experience of the subaltern woman in the post-colonial nation state. And then she also obviously tells us that you know, general feminism can also not do that. And that class, by and large, also fails to enunciate or capture the full richness of the life of the post-colonial subaltern woman. And that if we do that, right, if we take the hegemonic way of looking at the world and subaltern subaltern consciousness or subaltern subjectivity and assume that we can study the subaltern in the post-colony with the tools purely used within the Western context, then we will end up doing what the colonizers did, and that is we will end up silencing the voice of the subaltern. It will be the same project. And that's why the instructive sentence at the end of the passages I read is, and the subaltern wo wo woman will be as mute as ever. Right? And there is a footnote there, end note, note 57, which I think is the longest note in the essay. I highly encourage you to read it. What I also encourage you to do is read the revised version of the essay in a critique of post-colonial reason and see how she slightly reworks it. But what we learn from this paragraph, and as we read further from other paragraphs, is that the point she is highlighting here is that the tools developed in the Western Ac Academy and used to study subalternity may not be effective or useful in retrieving, articulating, and talking about the subjectivity of the post-colonial subaltern woman or the consciousness of the 
subaltern woman. So do keep in mind, subjectivity and consciousness might be related, but the moment you enter the consciousness, you're entering psychoanalysis, you're entering Freud. That's why there is a discussion of Freud next, right? But she also challenges Jonathan Culler's idea that most of this is the way people approach the other is positivistic. They reduce it to certain factual details, and there is a critique of that as well. For your understanding, I would recommend that you need to know why she is placing herself within this debate, because her argument is that the Western scholars at the end of the day have a hegemonic way of looking at non-West, and in the process of making their statements, they either do it by assimilating the other or by completely negating the other, and that's the example she uses against Foucault and Deleuze. So what is important here is not necessarily to go into the details of these debates, but to understand that she is pointing out through these complex references that whatever is available or is being offered or perpetuated by the Western intellectuals or the academy is not enough to study or talk about the subaltern and to decide whether or not the post-colonial subaltern can speak. And then she will go into how the post-colonial subaltern woman was inscribed within the discourse of colonialism and the native discourse of gendered female identity. And that will be her point, right? And we'll get to that in a few moments. So I hope this makes a little bit of sense. So I'm going to read a little more, especially where she talks about Freud, and especially Freud's essay, A Child is Being Beaten which was his study of perversions in which he discusses sadomasochism masochism, and connects it to issues of individual pre-edipal memory of the children and also sort of a collective repression. That's what she's playing with. But in order to study that, Freud, of course, creates this sentence which he keeps amplifying in the essay, and it starts with, a child is being beaten, and then a child is being beaten by a father. But the main thing to keep in mind is that throughout the essay, he's focused on the male child's psyche and is either clueless about the female child's desire and psyche, but also kind of colonizes the female consciousness under the rubric of uh, the male child's psyche. That's pretty much what I understand by it. But I'll read this part a little and then share with you my understanding of the connection. Why is she referring to that particular instance in Freud and then using in constructing her sentence, which is white men saving brown women from brown men. Right. So here I go. As Sarah Kaufman has shown, the deep ambiguity of Freud's use of women as a scapegoat is a reaction formation to an initial and continuing desire to give the hysteric a voice, to transform her into the subject of hysteria. The masculine imperialist ideological formation that shaped that desire into the daughter's seduction is part of the same formation that constructs the monolithic third world woman. As a post-colonial intellectual, I'm influenced by the formation as well as part of our unlearning project is to articulate that ideological formation by measuring silences, if necessary, into the object of investigation. Thus, when confronted with the questions, can the subaltern speak and can the subaltern as woman speak, our efforts to give the subaltern a voice in history will be doubly open to the danger, dangers run by Freud's discourse. As a product of these considerations, I have put together the sentence, white men are saving brown women from brown men in, in a spirit not unlike the one to be encountered in Freud's in investigation of the sentence, a child is being beaten. 
The use of Freud here does not imply an isomorphic analogy between the subject formation and the behavior of social collectives, a frequent practice often accompanied by a reference to Reich in the conversation between Deleuze and Foucault. So I'm not suggesting that white men are saving brown women from brown men is a sentence indicating a collective fantasy symptomatic of a collective itinerary of sadomasochistic repression in a collective imperialist enterprise. There is a satisfying symmetry in such an allegory, but I would rather invite the reader to consider it a problem in wild psychoanalysis than a clinching solution. Just as Freud's insistence on making the woman the scapegoat in a child is being beaten and elsewhere discloses his political interest, however imperfectively, so my insistence on imperialist subject production as the occasion for this sentence discloses my politics. Further, I'm attempting to borrow the general methodological aura of Freud's strategy toward the sentence he constructed as a sentence out of the many similar substantive accounts his patients gave him. This does not mean I will offer a case of transference in analysis as an isomorphic model for the transaction between reader and text, my sentence. The analogy between transference and literary criticism or historiography is more than a productive catechesis. To say that the subject is a text does not authorize the converse pronouncement, the verbal text is a subject. I'm fascinated rather by how Freud predicates a history of repression that produces the final sentence. It is a history with double origin, one hidden in the amnesia of the infant, the other lodged in our archaic past, assuming by implication a pre-originary space where human and animal were not yet differentiated. We, have worked, we are driven to impose a homologue of this Freudian strategy on the Marxist narrative to explain the ideological dissimulation of imperialist political economy and outline a history of repression that produces a sentence like the one I have sketched. This history also has a double origin, one hidden in the maneuverings behind the British abolition of widow sacrifice in 1829, the other lodged in the classical and Vedic past of Hindu India, the Rig Veda and the Dharma Shastra. No doubt there is also an undifferentiated pre-originary space that supports this history. The sentence I have constructed is one among many displacements describing the relationship between brown and white men, sometimes brown and white women worked in. It takes its place among some sentences of hyperbolic admiration or of point pious guilt that Derrida speaks of in connection with the hieroglyphist prejudice. The relationship between the imperialist subject and the subject of imperialism is at least ambiguous. So I've briefly talked about what she is doing in these passages. It's a long passage, but what she is trying to tell us is as to why she is going to Freud. She's going to Freud not necessarily because Freud's this particular essay has an answer, but it gives her a sort of a method, a method that allows her to track what's at play in the consciousness of the subaltern woman or woman in the colonies. And in order to do that, just as Freud constructs his sentence, a child is being beaten and how that is connected to fantasies and eventually perversion, she is constructing her own sentence, white men saving brown women from brown men. And under that rubric, what she's saying is there are two discourses at play. First is, of course, the imperial codification of the law by the British, abolition of sati. And two is the native right, root of the practice itself, how it was justified, where does it come from, who is reading which text. And caught in between these two discourses is the subject of sati, 
the woman who self-immolates. That is why she is constructing this analogical method by using this one sentence to guide her discussion. There are a couple of terms that she uses. There's one ref reference to the hieroglyph, uh, hyperbolic admiration. We had encountered this previously in Derrida's discussion of the hieroglyphic prejudice in the early linguistic studies of Europe where the Egyptian script was already you know, privileged and considered sublime. The second reference is what she calls wild psychoanalysis. That's a reference to Freud himself in one of his essays in which he derides people who try to reach hasty conclusions while performing psychoanalysis without actually performing the scientific deliberative method of reaching a diagnosis or something. So that is what he called wild psychoanalysis. And that term refers to that. So from here on then she will move on to discuss sati as a practice. How did the British see it and how did they make it into an emblematic instance to control, to prove their civilizational mission? And how was it certified and sanctified through the Hindu sacred texts themselves? What kind of reading was involved? And in both these processes, what happens to the actual subject who immolates herself when her husband dies? And from there, then, she will take us to a real instance of self-sacrifice, right, before she makes that famous pronouncement that the subaltern cannot speak. So we'll read a little more, talk a little more about this, and then go towards the conclusion. Now the thing to keep in mind in this, in this last section is what she's trying to suggest and prove, prove is that the figure of the subalternized post-colonial woman or colonized woman is doubly inscribed and colonized. She's colonized through the discourse of power of the colonizers who are doing it in the name of protecting her. And then she is also colonized through the nativist practice of retrieving a certain kind of womanhood from the sacred texts. Right? And so in one way she is apotheosized as this self-immolating hero. And in the other way she is seen as a victim right, who must be protected by the empire. But in both these movements, in this double inscription, what we do not know of and what we do not hear is the subaltern woman speak herself. That is the point, right? That's where she is headed. Can she speak from that position as a subalternized woman? Right? And that's why she's going to an extreme example of what happens to a female body, both through the imperial law and through the native cultural tradition and its interpretation. So that's crucial to keep in mind. The widow ascends the pyre of the dead husband and immolates herself upon it. This is widow's sacrifice. The conventional transcription of the Sanskrit word for the widow would be sati. The early colonial British transcribed it sati. The rite was not practiced universally and was not caste or class fixed. The abolition of this rite by the British has been generally understood as a case of white men saving brown women from the brown men. White woman from the 19th century British missionary registers to Mary Daly have not produced an alternative understanding. Against this is the Indian nativist argument, a parody of the nostalgia for lost origins. The woman actually wanted to die. The two sentences go a long way to legitimize each other. One never encounters the testimony of the woman's voice consciousness. Such a testimony would not be ideolo ideology, ideology transcendent or fully subjective, of course, but it would have constituted the ingredients for producing a counter sentence. 
as one goes down the grotesquely mistranscribed names of these women, the sacrificed widows in the police reports included in the records of the East India Company, one cannot put together a voice. The most one can sense is the immense heterogeneity, breaking through even such a skeleton and ignorant account. Faced with the dialectically interlocking sentences that are constructible as white men are saving brown women from brown men and the women wanted to die, the post-colonial woman intellectual asks the question of simple semiosis. What does this mean? And begins to plot a history. So, Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole essay, but from this point on, from what I just read, she's already pointing to these two overarching registers within which the figure of the woman is inscribed. One is the civilizational mission, and it makes it a point to sell itself, to offer itself as the savior of native women, right? So laws are made, and sati is abolished and made illegal. And within that, they also then rope in the reformative Hindus and have their testimony. But the whole idea, what she's trying to say, is that it's not just that they're trying to save women. It's also connected to the rise of new form of capitalism over the mercantile capitalism. And that is the silenced history that must be kept in mind. But in that process, the women who they are trying to save are never heard of. They are spoken for, right? They are mentioned, right? But they are not heard. We can't retrieve a voice. The other spect aspect of the spectrum is the native ways of either representing them as willing warrior women who want to die or women who are chosen or coerced into performing the sati because they own property, especially in Bengal and all. But even within that, there is a misreading of the Hindu sacred texts, of course, where people have misread it, Agni, the fire, against the word that could be home, that she will enter her home. But that whole discussion tells you that there was a native discourse in support of it, and then, you know, the colonizers discourse the subject for both of them is the figure of the woman the sati the most subalternized subject what we don't find in that is she speaking for herself right then she also gives us a distinction between johar and sati johar was an act of collective suicide performed by rajput women when the Muslim invaders would come from the north, the famous one, the first Johar, was uh, by the Rajputs of Chitor. And that was a totally different ritual by one specific tribe in which the women would prepare themselves before the fortress was about to fall, and they, along with their children, would walk into the fire. And that performance was called Johar. In the morning, the men, the warriors, would take the ashes from that and put it on their forehead, right, as a tilak, and they will ride out to their death, and that part of the ritual was called saka, right? Though that's completely different from sati. But what she's trying to highlight is that in order to retrieve the figure of this subaltern woman, we can neither do it through a Western liberal discourse of saving the victims or through the nativist discourse of rationalizing it. The post-colonial critic who creates a narrative and a methodology must be aware of both. Any critic who is not aware of the subtleties of one end or the other will end up colonizing the very figure of women whom they are trying to retrieve from the silences of history. Now, this is a really crucial point, and if you want a more elaborate engagement with it, I highly recommend Chandra Mohanty's Under Western Eyes and Feminism Without Borders, because this is the issue that she deals with, and her book comes after this, right? 
But keep this in mind. This is what she's trying to do in the last part, is trying to articulate this is what it would take for you, for you as a critic to understand the figure of Sati, but also to the understand the sentence, white men saving brown women from brown men. What motivates the white men? What discourse underwrites it? What economic demands underwrite it? And then how do brown men connected to issues of nationalism, pure female identity, how do they read it? And how do they misread their own scripture, their own sacred texts? And from there then she gives, she does this move, a catacresis, leaving the argument here and giving us a historical example of Boban Swari, right? Who famously had committed a suicide, right? And she was part of the resistance movement. She had been ordered to assassinate someone. She couldn't bring herself to do that, so she commits suicide. But she makes sure that she does that when she's mensurating, so that no one assumes that she did it because of an illicit relationship. And so her body writes this script. She speaks and says, I am killing myself, but not because I am pregnant. And Spivak says many years later when she met two of her nieces or grandnieces, she asked them about her and they said, well, it was a case of some kind of illicit affair. Which means that even when the subaltern woman speaks with her body and leaves a message, even her own family still misreads it. And that leads Spivak to the final sentence of the essay, which, of course, I will read. I know of Bowen Saveri's life and death through family connections. Before investigating them more thoroughly, I asked a Bengali woman, a philosopher and Sanskritist whose early intellectual production is almost identical to mine, to start the process. Two responses. Why, when her two sisters, Salesweri, and rice worry led such full and wonderful lives. Are you interested in the hapless Bhuvanswari? I asked her nieces. It appears that it was a case of illicit love. I have attempted to use and go beyond Deridian deconstruction, which I do not celebrate as feminism as such. However, in the context of the problematic I've addressed, I find his morphology much more painstaking and useful than Foucault's and Deleuze's immediate substantive involvement with more political issues. The latter's invitation to become woman, which can make their influence more dangerous for the US academic as enthusiastic radical. Derrida marks radical critique with the danger of appropriating the other by assimilation. He reads catacresis at the origin. He calls for a rewriting of the utopian structural impulse as rendering delirious that interior voice that is the voice of the other in us. I must here acknowledge a long-term usefulness in Jacques Derrida, which I seem no longer to find in the authors of the history of sexuality and mille plateaus, a thousand plateaus. The subaltern cannot speak. There is no virtue in global laundry lists with woman as a pious item. Representation has not withered away. The female intellectual, as intellectual, has a circumscribed task which she must not disown with a flourish. So here we are at the end of a long journey. This was part five of my reading of Can the Subaltern Speak? I'm pretty sure that I've still not done justice to the whole project, but I hope it is useful to you. Now this ending where she says subaltern cannot speak, the idea isn't just that the subaltern cannot speak. The idea is that the post-colonial intellectual, especially post-colonial female intellectual must not assume that subalterns can speak for themselves and hence continue her proje project of retrieval and speaking alongside and with the subaltern. That's the project. Remember, Spivak is 
also a scholar of didactics and education. And in one of her other books, Other Asias, she talks about our job as humanists is to train the imagination of our students at both ends of the global divide, right? Here, teaching our students in the United States to think of the other, right? not as this exotic other, but as a constituted part of themselves. And then in the periphery, teaching our students about the values of democracy and their own place and their own right in it. This is her view of what involves didactics in education. And if the subaltern subjects have not thought about these things critically, even when they speak, right, they will be speaking in the vocabularies of the neoliberal capital. In order to develop their own voice going through Paulo Freire then, they must develop a political voice of politics. Now Spivak is aware of the critiques that came of this essay, right? This became a huge essay. There were people who wrote about why can the subaltern vote with their bodies, they are counted, they resist physically of course. And Spivak is not denying that, but in revising the essay in the chapter entitled History in a Critique of Postcolonial Reason, then she goes on page 273. He says, my question about how to earn the secret encounter with the contemporary hill woman of Simor is a practical version of this. Can the subaltern speak? The woman of whom I will speak in this section was not a true subaltern, but a metropolitan middle class girl. Further, the effort she made to write or speak, her body was in the accents of accountable reason, the instrument of self-conscious responsibility. This is Vuan Swari's suicide. Still, her speech act was refused. She was made to unspeak herself posthumously by her cousins and all who thought that it was an illicit affair, by other women. In an earlier version of this chapter, I had summarized this historical indifference and its results as the subaltern cannot speak. That's this essay that we talked about. And she also goes on to say that my conclusion was hasty, but I still maintain that looked at from her perspective the role of global capital, the role of overarching liberal and conservative ideologies of the West and the native ideologies of the nation state and now the Hindutva movement, in order for the subaltern to come to voice, they will have to first become a political constituency. But the role of the intellectual will still remain the same, that of representing in solidarity with the subaltern subjects. And that's where I agree with Spivak wholeheartedly as a scholar. So this was part five of my attempt at explaining can the subaltern speak. I highly recommend that you should watch it from the beginning to the end, but also do keep in mind that these lectures, long as they are, first of all, cannot carry the burden of the essay, cannot still fully explain it. Two, as a scholar, I myself still do not consider myself qualified enough to really do justice to this essay. So what I've done is I have offered you, with a lot of preparation, the best that I can do. This is not the final word on this essay. There are people much more educated and eloquent than than I who have done it, and I highly encourage you to read them. But if this is useful to you, and if it makes your job easier to read and understand this highly important and complex essay, then my job is done. Thank you so much for your time, and as always, take care of yourself, take care of others around you, and I will now see you next time. Until then, Peace and love.